Wa guan, everybody. Welcome to the Dis Afimi History Podcast, where we'll be speaking about history and as well family history and how history relates in terms of Caribbean people um, for the present as well as in the past and how in the past what that does and brings forth for what we are going through at present and what we can learn from our history, from our family, and take that moving forward. So I do hope you enjoy the podcast. And if you like it, please ensure to subscribe, like, and review. Thank you. I just want to thank you both, uh, Sue and Judy, for coming on to the podcast uh, to talk about uh, the Duppy story. So I'll get you both to introduce yourselves and to let the audience know who you are. So go ahead, Judy. Okay, yes, my name's uh, Judith, Dr. Judith Bruce Balding, and um, I'm in the West Midlands in Birmingham, England, and I'm just, yeah, fascinated with exploring ancestry, but also voices and stories and creativity. Perfect. Go ahead, Sue. Yeah, hi, everyone. Greetings. My name is Sue, Sue Brown. I also live in the West Midlands in the UK. I am also um, a writer, performance poet, um, presenter, radio presenter, TV presenter. I am also interested in the unspoken narratives within our culture that seems to be um, underrepresented and um, especially to do with our traditions and culture. So this is a great project to be part of. Um, I am also um, a co-founder of Nakawana, yeah, founded by Judith, Dr. Judith Bruce Golden. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, for you both. And we'll start off with, you know, everybody grew up in the Caribbean or the diaspora would have known Duppy. What role does Duppy play in traditions and in the stories? Okay. So, um, as I said, I was, I, I am from the UK, but both my parents are from the Caribbean, from Jamaica. And, um, we were brought up with, um, duppy stories. They were sometimes a little scary. And sometimes I look and I reflect and I think, well, why did, you know, why would our dad, why would my dad tell us these stories and, and scare us? But on the, on the bigger picture, it was part of, um, you know, it's part of the tradition to tell us these stories and to keep those stories going. Um, so we, like I said, we were brought up with duppy stories. Didn't, I don't think, understand the full meaning of what they were and the significance of what they were. I don't think we understood that, or I didn't, you know, till much, much later. But I suppose on the bigger picture, it's, it's a way of continuing the um, lineage, the, the storytelling of, these traditional oral stories that could get lost within the the world that we live in. Um, you know, um, these stories originated from various parts of Africa and in the transporting of the Africans to the Caribbean and the diaspora, some of those stories were held and remembered uh, through the oral tradition. And trying to remember them had to be told. And over time, they would perhaps change or things would be added because of language, because of the environment and, um, and the experience, these new experiences we had. Um, and it was the only way to hold on to these memories. And like I said, my parents came to the UK. They came in the fifties. Um, which wasn't that long ago, but that was part of the heritage that they brought here to the UK. Um, and you're, we're living in a world where um, we're saying, okay, we're alive, we're here, we are under the umbrella of religion. So you are born, you live a particular way, you die, you go to what they say, hell or to heaven. So with many of the African cultures, the next world or the other worlds, as well as this world, are still connected. And I suppose in some ways, um, I would say the system has tried to disconnect us from that. Um, 
with filling our heads with distraction and being in a new world. So it puts us in a place that we don't really remember who we are. So Doppy Stories in particular is something that with the project that Judith and I worked on was something that we felt that we had to embrace and, and look at it from a perspective to say, there is no fear here because it has been resold to us as fearful and evil and bad and wicked and all those kind of things. And um, through this project, you know, we're showing like we own this. And if we're saying all these things are wicked and bad and evil, what does that say about us? Especially in a way when we're more ready to embrace other cultures, their horror stories, pay money to go to the cinema and watch some some images and sounds that are just like, wow, out of this world. But anything reflecting ourselves, we don't want to address. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more on that um, because it's it's the it's the narrative that anything black is bad and mm -hmm. that is not the case but it's part of that whole narrative of kind of beating us down and so we don't associate to our own heritage to our own history as well and so then what could you say in terms of some of the common characteristics or themes that tuppies have in Caribbean culture? I mean, even just drawing on what Sue said, mm -hmm. and when we think about many Duppy stories, there's a lot of fear associated with these stories. So um, scaring someone. And it's not something that if you, if the underlying face of this narrative is about fear, then it's not something that people will voluntarily want to explore because the fear. And so... Some of the themes that when we did the Duppy stories, we think about um, the the themes were linked to either a warning or a warning sign or um, just connection mm -hmm. and the importance of connection. So on one side, there's a fear of um, hearing about stories that um, were meant to, to scare people. But on, on the other side, it was about, well, you're hearing a story about an ancestor or a doppy or a ghost that allows you, it gives you the opportunity to want to be able to connect with this ancestor or, or not. But what we were seeing is, you know, just expanding it out to what's happening in social or cultural history and a way of keeping those stories alive. That as Sue mentioned in the first question, that parents my parents came to England as well, but imagine these memories that were stored were the connection mm -hmm. and, and that, that can be very powerful. So some of those common themes, we sort of saw them as looking at the fear side, mm -hmm. but also the opportunity to connect. And also add into that, within the, uh, within the Duppy stories, um, what was really... Um, let me say, I don't know what word to use, impressive, was that the, those, the participants were elders, many of them were elders, which for us was, was beautiful because one in particular, Elaine, Elaine, yeah, it was her, it was her idea. She said, we would run a number of projects and we said, oh, what, you know, what can we, you know, look at for the next project? And she says, what about Duppy stories? Now for many of those elders as well, they're well into their religion well into the religion. So when she said that, we was like, wow, yeah, because we already know how doppy stories and religion sit. Yeah. So for them to say, yes, okay, they wanted to be part of this, um, even though they're, they're sitting in the church, but doppy stories are real, mm -hmm. real part and part, even though they may have to mask it to a different, to a degree. Yeah. No, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, how do the W stories differ from other supernatural or paranormal entities in the, within the Caribbean mythology, such as jumbies or spirits? Well, I think that um, the Caribbean reflects many, many 
mythologies and terminologies of spirits and duppies, right? Again, influenced by the environment, by language, by religion, all of these things. All of them inspired by the African practice that we recall and we remember. And also other cultures being part of it. So I would say that they, I'm not sure about the difference. It would be like um, their roles would be the same. Their manifestation may be slightly different and how we see them and what we call them might be different, but the purpose would be basically the same. As Judy says, we're, in, we're, we're connecting with these, these spirits for guidance or, or protection or warning. And so, but based on where we are, if we're in the Caribbean, based on our experience of life and our, our religion, we would re perhaps reshape them fit them into the narrative of where we are. Yeah. yeah. And and feeding into that when we sort of, I, I had the privilege of working in um, Bermuda and even just seeing how even across the islands or, or, or worldwide, there, there is, there are those connections. So in places like it, the name Jombi, different names, and as Sue said, ghosts, but we see that those origins of like African origins of spirit and protection, and we can imagine just even the, the journey on those ships where people were dying and just a horrendous situation around the slaves and how calling for protection, calling for spirits, calling for guidance was an important aspect of survival. Mm -hmm. um, especially if those family, the, the, the ancestral ties had been broken or severed during those distressing experiences. And so who would not want to call on great grandmother or the wisdom to, for guidance? How are we going to get through this? Mm -hmm. So one of the spirits that we looked at was um, even just Sue and I in research and talking about it was you know, Moko Jombi, which is a protecting spirit, a protecting spirit in Trinidad and Tobago. So it feeds into how the fear, what narrative is that coming from? Who is t saying that these spirits are to hurt or harm? Mm -hmm. Because we now know that they, if we look into our cultural culture, um, there's many strands that would see sp spirits as protecting ones for guidance, ones for, you know, traveling journeys, we need to be, have some kind of protection. And so we find that very interesting. And, and again, coming back to what you're saying as well, Judith. So if you imagine you have the continent and, and a great amount of souls, human beings are scraped up and put into one, uh, the ship. Now they may not know the language that each of the, each of them speak. But the nuances that they, they, they feel that the, 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 the language of the West, they wouldn't know that, but they would communicate and each of them would go to what they know, go to what they know. And in the same way, you know, people say, well, they would pray because you would, you, you, you know, for them, if you imagine just on a day to day, they're walking through the forest in Africa somewhere. And they're calling on certain spirits to help them through the forest, right? They're through the forest. They're not sure what is going on, but they know there may be creatures or poison, bush or whatever. So they're asking for that. Now they're in something, in a situation that isn't necessarily the forest, but there is a sense of fear and danger, but on a greater, greater level, because it's not part of the psyche. Being in the hold of a ship, you might as well say be in the whole of, I, I don't even know, some madness. But then you would call upon something that you are, no, what has supported you and your family and your peoples forever. And then once you leave that now and we arrive at wherever we arrive and you're seeing all these different people and you recognize that there are some who you know are coming from the continent and there are some that are, are aliens, as in white, and maybe others. So we are communicating with each other. We do it today. 
we get on the bus so we go somewhere and we see another black person and basically we're like yeah because we know mm -hmm. so then we're trying to we we don't have the language maybe to communicate with each other but now we're in a in a, in a position where we'll be calling call upon our ancestral spirits and we may recognize how someone is calling upon them and say oh yeah they're calling on that mm, we call that that mm -hmm. you know and and there was a story you know what i'm saying so we're, we're trying to hold on to these connections ancestral connections and, and why would we not want to do that mm -hmm. if you know we, you know thinking that you have that say th there might be that physical space where you are protected in africa and then you're moved into this insecure space but you have nothing but you own that's all you have yeah. your yeah. memories the things that kept you safe and you will keep that mm -hmm. as something that that that's all you have yes. you haven't got the physical around you but there is other things happening that you and, keep. and yeah and then we will recognize in that new space we will, there are certain things in nature we'll recognize. We'll recognize the river. We'll recognize the sky. We'll recognize the, the trees, the plants, the there. So there's some sense of reference. Mm. And if you're used to calling on the spirit of the, of the, of the forest, we will think, well, there's this forest over there, a woodland over there. Maybe the spirit that we normally call upon will be there. Spirit of the water, the fire, whatever it is. And because of, um, the connection with nature as well, we will probably feel it in a particular way. So we don't know Christianity or any other religion yet. We, we're, we're not indoctrinated on any of those yet. So we're still connected. But then those who are in control are seeing that we have a spirit about us that is not broken. And so it's about trying to break that spirit in the physical sense, as in your emotions and everything. But that spiritual uh, guidance to whip that out of us and put in place something else. Yeah, I couldn't agree you know, more. And I know, Judith, you talked to this, but is there any other like traditional beliefs or practices associated with, with protecting oneself from deputies or interacting with them? Yeah, I would say that when we when we did um the Doppy Stories project, it was great because we see that everyone had their own interpretation and experience of Doppies or spirit. And I also, when I think I, I enjoy the position, but I also work for crews, which is working with those who are bereaved. And, you know, it, it's one of those where you think you're not in a position to say, no, you didn't see that. Because sometimes there are many records that people do say that I saw, I saw this person who died sitting at the dinner time, dinner table and they try to communicate or say, most sometimes they might say, go away because it's fear. You're not supposed yeah. to be here. Get out, get out. And that's, I've experienced that. But I also see that even with that, there's that, you have to step back and see that this is that person's experience. So mm -hmm. when we think about celebrating and remembering the ancestors and the spirits, it's traditional, but we also see that in sort of, you know, the, de the Mexican Day of the Dead, mm -hmm. where that throughout the cultures, there is this space of a connection, whether people want to acknowledge it or not, that's then the question. But if we know that these sort of stories are being documented, people writing down or people communicating, having photographs and sharing, this is what uncle did. This is what great, great grandma did. Um, it, it's, it's there. Their lives are there as for, for sometimes a reason to learn from and to continue that communication. So on some aspects, it could also be looked at for, uh, positive and negative outcomes you know how people would perceive that they would use um beliefs and practices about doppies we want this doppie to do this and sometimes it might be received as oh no this has happened it must be doppie or something negative so it depends on the context it depends on what people believe as well um 
and we th we thought about even in in the uh, discussions people wrote about using uh, the use of fire the use of water as soon draw drew on the natural aspects of the, the nature nature and the world that wherever you go in, in this world there will always be nature there will be the sea the sun the the, the core aspects of nature we talked about using salt using mm -hmm. rice grains yeah. wood and stone the use of plants and fruits and all of these different things including med meditation as well as a way of connecting um psalms the bible religious uh you, you know spiritual writings drumming chanting there's so many ways of communicating so when we think about us as a nation as a people we like to we, we use body we use movement we use voice we use sense it's like a multi multi sensory experience sometimes when we think about what we connect to sometimes it's a vibration it's it's animals it's it's very grounded in in how we can communicate with spiritual doppi or sensing things around us yeah and 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 adding to that if you imagine now we have this connection with nature all those things that you're saying there um, and even bringing in the religion, because we're using the Psalms now and the Bible or references to, to, um, the spirit. On the flip side of that, the religion and the law will tell you that what you are doing naturally is wrong and it has to stop. So now you have something in place and this is, uh, and this is the only way. This is the truth and this is the only way. And it's your religion. So then all the things, all the connections that you have naturally, that has to stop. And when we're put in a position of um, living fear, you know that if you even say, uh, let's say, even if you said the word doppi, not only are those who are in control around you are going to um, punish you, those, your own people are in fear now because... The fear isn't necessary of the word doppi. The fear is what the consequences of you. Yeah. So those consequences could be that you would be beaten. You'd be put in a hole somewhere. Your children could be taken from you. Uh, it could be anything. So then the fear moves now to a different level because it's, it's in the physical presence. You imagine you have your baby, your child or whatever, and you know that these people can come and take that child away from you and, and, and be sold. And then, you are caught just saying the word doppi and they can come and take your child away. So now you're living in a constant fear. And then on a Sunday, you were told, come to the master's house at the front day. Everybody gather. We're going to pray. And you're like, yeah, okay. Put our hands together, close our eyes and do the thing. Yeah. But then there are those who are saying, with ref learning the language as well, there are certain things that are said that say, well, that does make it makes sense, you know, that yeah, we need to look good and behave ourselves and things like that. These are things that we know. We already know these things, but it's just repackaged and presented in a different way. But the way we used to interact with nature has changed. Mm. It's changed. But then in saying that, on that plantation or wherever we were, you can't disconnect a hundred percent because it's still within you. It, you know, we have our hair and they cut off our hair for whatever reason. It will grow back to as it should do. They'll cut it off, it will grow back to, and you know, it may get a little weaker, but it will grow back. So then we now, maybe in the kitchen, we're in the kitchen and we see salt. Oh, we know how we can use salt. So we might hold back a little bit to do in our little hut or wherever we are to do little reference, little rituals. Somebody might start, as Judith was saying, chanting. We can't really drum because everybody will hear that, but we, we can hum, yeah? We can hum, we can beat our chest. We know what we're saying. So we're holding on to what we can. And then if we, if, if we like, if, like the three of us, we are in one space and our, if we were born in, in the Caribbean, 
or if we were born in the Caribbean, our parents, we knew they came from Africa, but we may have three parents are from different parts in Africa, but we may have a story that's similar. And so we will, and, and we're trying to remember just like, you know, in a conversation, we're like, yes, my mama, she told me that this is what we do. Healing. Oh, natural. He said, again, we're in a new space, but we can recognize that there are certain plants and certain things we can use to heal. And then we have to keep that quiet because not only the masters or those in control, if they're watching, if they know, we know the consequences, but also within our own group, the fear of those who may know that we're doing that. So we keep things quiet. So things get further and further and further pushed down. And then in the distortion of that, the term doppies or ghost and spirit then transform into something else because of the consequences more than what it is itself, I think. And, and to think that there is still the Obia law in oh. Jamaica. There is a law against, a law against Obia. Legislate, yeah. law. And it's still, still active. there. Yeah. Still active. What what would we say is that about if if it's just as some people might say it's just heebie jeebie talk it's just nothing if you have to put a law behind something that's real is it not that shows you how they took it seriously just in the same way they removed the drum from many of the islands you weren't allowed to pay the drum. Now, on a one level, it would be like, well, some rhythms going on and some music and da-da-da-da. But they know the power of the drum when it connects, those vibration connects. They know the frequency that you need to be in. And then, and then the dance rituals that we will have. So it's not just about dancing. There is, there is movement that creates the vibration of certain frequency. And they're aware of that. So again, the link in that with um, anything outside of the religion is wrong. However, the religion itself has taken some of those aspects and put it as part of. They go into certain church and they burn incense and they burn this and they chant mm -hmm. and they use certain rocks and stones. Yeah, So they're there, they are aware of them. What they need to do is to, to separate us and, 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 and present it in a different way. I think with voodoo, voodoo and the Catholic religion, and I'm not 100% sure on this, but there is a strong connection. So many of them who say, yes, on Sunday I go to church, I'm Catholic. But then there are many who, who communicate with the dead outside the church, although they will take aspects of the church and the religion with voodoo. No, definitely. And those are, I think, more of the Catholic, um, more with the Spanish and Portuguese. Yes. That those islands that were colonized by them were more prevalent there. And, you know, I agree with, you know, both what you said in terms of it's that disconnection and to make it that these Duffy stories are not part of our own heritage, which they are. And, and I know you talked a little bit about in terms of the different types of Dippy stories that would be for the different Caribbean um, islands. I don't know if you have another, because you showed, you mentioned about the one example about Trinidad. Is there another island that has a, a different um, popular Dippy story as well? Um, is it Papa? I can't pronounce this. Yeah, Papa, Papa Bois. That's Papa it. Bois. Yeah. From Trinidad. Um, is it from T T Tobago? Is yeah, it from well, Tobago? Saint, yeah, Saint Lucia and Trinidad to, and Tobago. Yeah. So he lived in the um, the forest, and he's the father of protection of the animals there. So it is said that hunters would be in the forest and they would see him. Yeah, and he's there to protect the animals. And again, some part in Africa they would have the representation of that. Again, you're now in a new space. The forest is there, there are animals, and we know that animals and human beings can be in contention mm -hmm. sometimes. And human beings lose the plot sometimes, so he's there, and they take that seriously. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Um, Judith, remember uh, his wife? Yeah, well, we were talking like the research is shown as well, or the mythology of it is that Papa Papa Bois is Mama de Lou, Mummy Waters, mm -hmm. husband, mm -hmm. or other half or partner. And we can see already when we're thinking about water, the forest, nature, just that those protective factors, Mummy Water looked after was the, the water, you know, you think about those, the, the slaves, the souls in, in those seas. And then we have mummy water. And then we look at Papa Bois, father of the forest. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting one. These Barbados, you know, the, the, the Duffy known as Duffy. Yes. I'm sure that there was a ghost story called Duffy. Mm -hmm. Or there's some kind of, on, on television a while ago, Duffy, I think it's Duffy. Yeah. But that's Barbados. Mm -hmm. We also um, looked at, um, there's there's a spirit called la i said la diables so mm -hmm. in spanish espanol la diablo is the devil but it's this woman caribbean folks so talks about this woman uh, in its enslaved african uh, woman who made a deal with the devil and apparently the way that she would portray herself was kind of looked kind of beautiful looked very posed in the in her dress but beyond that there was a woman who had a, a hat, who was a hideous face. So it was almost, she was known as a demi-demon. Mm. Um, and spells were cast as well. Um, and so we also, that sort of linked in with an, another female who um, was also similar in that the, it, it, the, the name was a Sukoyant like a French word, but uh, linked to someone who would shapeshift, move around, blood-sucking hag was linked to uh, that woman, but also just to see how the power, by day she was an old woman, by night she was doing all these demonic things. But that, I'll leave Sue to talk about just the representation of, of women as well. When we hear these uh, folklore or Caribbean stories, and how women were represented and yeah because again now we're in a new space now it's, i could not i am not you know I, this is not my field or anything but in africa of course you have the duppies and you have the spirits and you have the ancestors and they all play a role i don't know the stories of the um the female entities that are now devilish and doing all these wicked things i i I'm, i don't know but what i do know from the diaspora and from the west and the the mentality about the female within their own culture it is easier to demonize the female so you have eve of the bible you know she my gosh she 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 crossed the line before her you had lilith oh my gosh you know, she she stood up for herself and she said, this thing is working for me. Then she's now demonized and she becomes this. Um, is it Medusa? Again, she was a beautiful woman, blah, blah, blah. And then next minute. So what I found with some of the stories we're here, because of the environment that we're in, because of the new stories and the, and the religion and all those things, they are woven into the stories. And they represent where they are at that time. So these stories are now coming out of the islands, merging with other stories, because there's a similarity. But if you're sitting and you're listening to these stories of these wicked women, you know, in history or local women, they kind of get woven into um, the story. Um, again, for me, it documents the period that time. So when we start to now sit like Judith, with, our, with the duppy stories now, we can sit and say, okay, we can reflect now and say, okay, this was the origin of this particular, and this is where we are now. And I suppose in this time, if we, where we are living now, I'm sure if there are certain things going on and you could have a hundred men doing some horrendous thing, you have one woman, they already write it up the story of how she, she's, evil and she sold her heart to the devil and she's she's a temptress you know so those also get woven into the um the stories 
you know, um, for the time. And so going on that theme, like, you know, how have these Duffy stories influenced Caribbean literature, art and music and other forms of cultural expression? I think we're fortunate that, um, I think back in the day, maybe 40, 50 years ago, you'd have somebody like Miss Lou and mm -hmm. one and two other writers who would, you know, tell their Duffy stories and locally, but to be in a theatre space or to go on radio, that would be very different. We have moved from that, partly as well because of the influence of media and Hollywood, because they constantly churning out all these horror stories and we've kind of acclimatized to it. So we feel like, well, if they're telling their story, we can tell our own story so we can go on the stage and we can write these stories and doppy stories. So now they're not just within the home. We can share them, you know, um, and, you know, at different events. Um, but also they influence today funerals because I hear in, in, in the UK in the past five years, I would say more and more people are at their funeral, at the cemetery, are drumming. We have African drummers or we have drummers and we have rituals where people are doing libation. In fact, when we did our Duppy story, we opened up every session with a libation. Yeah, we did our libation. So, um, and now people are using white rum at uh, the gravesides. Yeah, one time people would that what? In Britain as well, not at all. So now people are doing that. Um, when when I was younger, we would use, um, when we moved to a new house, we'd have to put salt all over the, every room and sweep everything out, sweep everything out. And so that now is open enough that we can talk about it within the art forms, within the music. Even in reggae, they, you know, they talk about doppies and doppie congress and did that because it, we can vocalize those things. Naming ceremonies and christenings. They're bringing in these things that you should do, these rituals. So it's not just about um, the, the names of certain rituals that were people would look and say, these are to do with doppies and ghosts. Now they're, they're, they're kind of bringing in. Yeah. Yeah, I, so to, I guess it's just it's part now of the cultural identity of the Caribbean is what you're seeing. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More so than it used to be. Yes. Yeah. I think it probably was there, but not so outwardly. And now that it's on in the theater spaces and people are writing plays and maybe one and two television programs and, and on YouTube and things like this. It gives people like, yeah, I know that. And then people are more likely to share these stories and bring them in. And, and our parents and grandparents will say, yeah, when I was a child, when, um, I think when my, um, my dad, my dad used to tell us that when, when certain people had died and they'd have the, the, the body in the house the night before. And then the children would be passed over the coffin mm -hmm. so that the spirit would not harm them. There are stories I've heard where the grandfather had died and the child, the children were put into the bed with the, the, the deceased till the morning, you know? Uh, I mean, I mean, it, you, it makes me think, especially coming from, say, a mental health background, it just brings into question how uh, GPs and mental health, Western trained mental health pers uh, practitioners, might view some of these behaviors because they would most likely be seen as this is very concerning yes <laughs> yes it is something that's crossed the line we don't understand that it just came to mind as as sue was sharing these things um, how it could be perceived from a western eye as well yes for sure yeah, you know, and, and, and it's, and the word taboo, you know, people may do it, but we don't know. Obviously things are very different because most of the time we don't hold the body in the house anyway. You know, they usually, if it does, if it comes in the morning before the funeral or something, but we don't tend to, you know, have the, the body in the house. So it, we, we don't do that. But if it were possible or in the Caribbean, they may do that still. 
uh, you know, some people may still do those things and other rituals and, and those who know, know. So I've been to a couple of funerals in Jamaica and there are certain things I've seen and I'm like, oh, really? Okay. And then there are other things that just gen it's a general funeral. But um, if you didn't notice it, yeah, but people do little things that, yeah, okay. And so it's, it, it's coming out. And like I said, within the arts and the culture. And there is, um, what do they call it? Um, um, oh, there are certain rituals. What do they call it now? Um, heritage, um, uh, um, heritage that you, you, I think funeral, Jamaican funerals are now become, um, national heritage. You know, when they, they, okay. they, what do you call it, Judith, where oh. they keep, um, there's a term for it. There's lots of things all over the world. Yes. Heritage, and they kept to say, almost to say, keep an eye on them to make sure they don't fade away. There's a term for it. I can't recall what it is. Yeah. And I think Jamaican funerals may be one of them as well. Yeah. And maybe reggae as well. Yeah. So it's holding on to these things. Yeah. So that they don't get forgotten. World heritage. Things. Yeah. Yeah. World heritage. Yeah. Okay. If you look into it. Yeah. And I think so every year, you know, they have all these different things around the world that they look at and say, OK. Um, and obviously the research is all done to say, OK, these things are changing or disappearing. And I think Jamaican funerals are one of them because they have changed. So if you think at funerals 50 years ago to funerals in Jamaica or the, the, the diaspora, how much they have changed. And where are they going to? Yeah. Yeah. So that just leads into, I guess, with the rituals and the festivals that celebrate or acknowledge the Duffy stories in the Caribbean and the diaspora. Is there anything else that you wanted to acknowledge in terms of what this reflects in terms of the cultural significance of the Duffy stories? Yeah, like the uh, like I said, we you know we previously funerals, you know we look at nine nights, you know, on the nine night, and that's about communicating. They're on their journey. Mm -hmm. you know into the next world and the ancestors are around and here is a time to have that meeting you know before the funeral which is significant and i don't know today how much of the nine night is still going on you it's know still going on but it's exactly. slightly different it's yes. it's yeah yeah they, it's, but they all recognize that the nine night has to be done yeah yes yes because it's part of the, the journey, you know, we're celebrating a life and they're going to the ancestors, they're on their way. And it's that meeting point where we can all gather and say, yeah, because as well, nine, nine night, nine nights, um, numbers and dates are very important, significant to us as well as part of rituals. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, so with your group, what are the, you know, the further the call to actions or the further putting out the Duffy st stories in the diaspora? What else are you guys doing um, to further uh, push out um, Duffy stories? I think, you know, as well as our own research, exploring our own ancestry, which has been great, um, and we discuss regularly what we were finding out, um, from the Duppy stories, um, one of our colleagues did, one of the storytellers um, did a um, Windrush celebration, which is looking at celebrating the ancestors who came over and just their journey. It, she, um, Pauline, um, she had somebody who was on the Windrush um, ship and he came and, and recounted his story from it as a young child coming over here from, I think, on the eight, aged eight. Um, and as part of that session, Jesse, he also presented his written piece. So I think what it's done, it's enabled people who have listened or been part of the project to start writing and connecting with those memories, what they remember of grandmother, grandfather, what the smells growing up. So I think people have gone on to their own journey and um, we also, at the Duffy Stories team, we also did a Kwanzaa event mm -hmm. uh, where um, some of those stories were uh, shortened into sort of five, ten minute stories and, and revisited. Um, so I think it's been a great 
call to action um, and, and we encourage anyone to connect with their ancestry in whatever form it looks like. And we had a wonderful speaker um, who talked about ancestry and Remembrance Day, Remembrance Sunday. Um, and he just put things into perspective. You know, we, we take time to remember, have Remembrance Day, but how much do we do it within our own culture? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think also adding to everything that Judith is saying, um, you know, the, the, the follow up from the actual Duppy stories and all the events that, um, have, you know, we have taken part in and, and those who took part are now going on and, and opening up in a different arena. Um, I think why, what has helped to enable that, that? is how we presented Duppy stories. I think there were, because we ran it online, of course, and, and we had our guest speakers, we had our storytellers, but we had an audience. Mm -hmm. And some, and you couldn't see their faces or anything like this, but for some, it was it enabled them to say, okay, I am interested, but this is a place where they felt safe. Yeah. Because again, coming back to the whole thing is fear. Mm -hmm. And people know Judith and respect her. People know myself and respect. So it's like, whoa, they, 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 they're telling these duppy stories. So, and whatever fears or whatever they may, and anxieties or whatever, the misconception, whatever, they still decided to come and, and listen. Yeah. And it gave them that opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully within their own self, they have spoken with us and the, the writers, etc. But thinking, yeah, I remember when I was young or when I was in Jamaica, this, that, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And so it's about embracing what we have mm -hmm. and remembering how everything that to everything about us has been sprinkled with this fear. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter what it is. Of course, there are dangers and, and things with, and, and negative things within all realms, yes. but we need to keep it into perspective, you know? And Absolutely. I think the, the Duppy stories has allowed many to say, yeah, I know Duppy stories. And some people came with some stories like, really? What? Yeah. yeah. But it, it was great just to add on to Sue. We had uh, Dr. Onye Onyeka Nubia. Yeah. Yes. And he was, um, he did some fascinating talks about ancestry and just the, the rites of passage. So even before birth, we're thinking about it. this is ancestry before pre-birth mm -hmm. to the actual living and the walking and breathing to 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 after you know after life mm -hmm. but the way that he broke it down and and just being able to locate generations of our ancestors during that time was fascinating mm -hmm. we also as part of the safe space had uh, a counselor called tanya wallace she had a background and history of, of tr you know, our trauma, you know, black trauma, and also the things that we might have, the fears in, in actually going there and talking about these things, because we did have people sort of jump back, like, Doc is sorry, nothing to do, I can't be involved in that, like, we were doing something wrong, and, and it was quite sad to see that, in fact, this is your ancestry. We could change the word Doc to spirit, we could change the word or sanitize it, you know, even that, even language we explored that, mm -hmm. but hearing a word could emote such a response of someone saying, boy, I'm not going to, I'm never, I'm not coming to that. That's just hearing one word and that's the power of language, mm -hmm. yes. which we found quite sad that mm -hmm. it was an opportunity for us to connect mm -hmm. and talk openly about what things that are going on in our lives and things that we've been brought up with. Mm -hmm. we, we need to lift that, that those barriers to conversation. And though lifting those barriers, it has to be in a safe space, which is what we did our best to provide a safe space. Because even though there may have been some who, yeah, yeah, doppy stories, we know about that, they may come and it may trigger something within them that they had forgotten about or, or whatever. But, you know, like Judith said, we had counselors there, we had people as part of this, the collective to support each other in a cultural way, in a language that we, we, we knew, we know. Yeah. 
and to say that we are here. So even if they had to leave or if they say, okay, come back to us afterwards or it, it, things were put in place because we know how that fear has um, traumatized us. And it's and funny, one of the things too as well is that one of the ladies who shared and said, this is the anniversary of my great, my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was almost like she said, you, you come to this event. Yeah. Yeah. And she shared about her, yeah. grand, you know, her, her relative. And it's things like that. You think, wow, how special we were introduced to this amazing woman who had an impact on this woman in, who was living. So why not share those stories to, to empower, encourage us in this safe space? And again, adding to that, there were others who would say they felt that their relatives or their loved ones were in their lives all the time. They felt that um, they could, yes, ma majority of the people there were Christians, but they, and of course they're going to pray to God, but they would say, but I'd call upon my mom and say, mom, X, Y, Z, dad or grandma, whatever. So that was their reality. That was their reality. And so they were saying, yes, I'm connecting with the ancestors or my ancestor or my mother or the spirit or the doppy. But they were in a space that they could say that, you know. That's great that your group was able to provide that type of a platform and a safe platform for them to be able to express. Because as you said, there is a lot of notions with Duffy's stories and it does come with a lot of, um, I guess you can say a bit negativity with it as well and mm -hmm. the backstory with that. So, you know, as we come to a close here, mm -hmm. you know, would there, you know, are there any other misconceptions or misunderstandings that you would like to address about Duffy stories that you'd like to clarify? Well, as you know, we have said that we are not, um, what's the word, um, experts on this. We're all on this journey, um, you know, and people are going to view it and experience it from where they're coming from. Um, you know, we're about exploring our ancestry and, and which including our own as well. Mm -hmm. um, the misconceptions are that um, fear has to be part of everything that we are, and it is wrong. It is wrong. I think that that's one of the things that we need to look at. It's on a massive scale, this is. But everything starts with self. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to change or rectify everything it has to start with self yeah and, and we'd all to, just to build on that to say that um you know every person's experience is their personal experience mm -hmm. and instead of using good and evil which is loaded these words are loaded which can result in fear we can look at harmful and mm -hmm. or, or we could look at helpful or unhelpful experiences Mm -hmm. And it's funny because it's sometimes it's the way it's packaged because I remember watching a, it was about building people, it's about a family, it was a white family who were rebuilding their home. And the man said to his, the presenter, he said, I, I feel like my father is with me and telling me I need to do this. And the presenter said, yes. And it, it, it was like a normal, and I thought, mm. it's ancestry and it's on television. Like it's a normal thing. Why is it when we look in within our own community, why can we not express it? I, I hear my father's voice or I hear my mother's voice mm -hmm. guiding me or my grandmother. It's almost seen as something that we're not able to explore because of other barriers that need to be broken down. And I thought to myself, if I'm hearing this with my own ears, mm -hmm. that this is... This is a normal experience for some people to say, I connect. My father would have loved this. My father said, go for it. It made me think, reflect on our community and how it's seen as the words evil or be careful. Don't go there. Mash up your head. You know, all these different terms that are used. So I would just think, you know, allow yourself to be open. And, and question why you might fear just the word doppy. And if a change of word would change things, why, why would that be? 
Ducky, the word Ducky originates from Africa as well. So let's let's start embracing and exploring. Yes. No, thank you. Create thank a you safe so space. Yeah. Create a safe space to do these. Yeah. Whatever we do. Yeah. Absolutely. Just like this. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> this is, you know, really a really good conversation to be had and I'm grateful for this time that you guys were able to be able to provide. And so to be able to talk about, you know, Duffy stories in, in this type of a manner, which is great because it, again, I think I said it to you before we even started recording, it is part of our heritage. It's in innate with us. So again, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please make sure to like, follow, subscribe, and write a review for the episode wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you.